Uh, Mike, uh, welcome to BackheadNews.com. It's great to have you with us. Um, first of all, how are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing really good because normally, you know, when I fly uh, from America, I'm always struggling with, with jet lag. Um, but this time I had an opportunity to fly from, from the East coast. Uh, so the jet lag is not as bad as, as it used to be back in the day. So, um, I'm feeling good. Mm -hmm. Um, what brought back you to Greece and Athens this summer? Uh, just missing friends that, that I consider family, you know, to me, um, you know, four years is a long time. You know, I had plans on, you know, um, coming here two years ago. Uh, when Panathinaikos and Barcelona was going to meet in the yearly playoffs. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, the pandemic happened and, and it shut the whole world down. So uh, basically for almost two years. So, you know, with that happening, it kind of, you know, put two more years on the two years that I, I wasn't here. Now that's four years. That's almost a half a decade. That's that's really too long. And, uh, you know, once uh, the, the world kind of opened back up where we can travel again, the first thing I told myself, you know, as soon as I get the vaccine, whatever, hmm. you know, saying I want to, you know, go home, my second home. And everybody's like, Mike, you know, you normally come, people come here for vacation. Why are you not on an island or nothing? I, I have time for that. But I, I wanted to, you know, come here and, and see people who's, uh, you know, really important to me in my life. Mm -hmm. um, I have to say congratulations on your initiative to hold an online auction Uh, with some of your collectible personal belongings from your time with mm -hmm. uh, Panathinaikos in order to make a donation yeah. to the fire victims in Greece. Uh, have you got any numbers on the items sold so far? Uh, I think it's close to 15,000 euros uh, for maybe a little less than that. But um, whatever money that I raise, big or small, you know what I'm saying? I, I just, you know, you know, want to help out in any way. Um, you know, I also, you know, being born and raised in California, And also, um, you know, staying up in the northern part of California for a part of my life, uh, you know, I also had a fire scare uh, myself, you know, and evacuating from your home for, you know, two, three, four hours and, you know, feeling defenseless, hopeless, uh, not knowing if you're going to come back to, you know, the person, your personal belongings, number one, but also a place of peace. We, you know, the roof over your head, we, we didn't know we was going to, you know, come back to that. So. It was a very difficult moment. And, you know, once the fire started here in Greece, you know, um, you, you felt for the people and, you know, the country. And, um, you know, I talked to my agent, Nick Lassos, a good friend of mine, Costas uh, Soterio. Um, you know, we bounced some ideals off of each other, you know, for a few days. And, you know, I came up with the, with the ideal to, you know, um, auction off some memorabilia. Um, I think that will go a long way. You know, the 2009 trophy of um, Panathinaikos, I think it's uh, it's part of history, but it's also a symbolic part of history just because the, the players that was on that roster and, you know, what we accomplished um, that year. Um, the shoes that I wanted to auction off was the, the last, you know, European title that Panathinaikos had 10 years ago and um, has all the autographs from all the players on there. And I think on the left shoe, it still has uh, the confetti, uh, you know, from, you know, the, the celebration on the bottom, you know, uh, of the shoe. So I think that's also symbolic as well. And then with the game worn jersey, you know, I just, you know, wanted to, to do something to help. And again, big or small, I knew it, it would go a long way. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, the other day you were pictured at a training session of Panathinaikos at Oaka. Uh, how did you mm -hmm. end up there again? I mean, whose idea was it? <laughs> uh, it's the first place I, I wanted to visit, you know what I mean? Um, and, you know, when I got up there, uh, the team was, was training. I knew they would be there. Um, you know, got to see uh, Virtus, got to talk with, uh, you know, Dimitri Priestis and, you know, Yorgos Kalizis, you know, former teammates of mine, um, people, you know, I went to war with that also, also re you know, respect me and also respect them. So, You know, I was able to talk to the team for, for three minutes about, you know, uh, developing habits, you know, having a routine and sticking to it and, be, and being disciplined with it. And, you know, also got a chance to talk with uh, Kendrick Perry. You know, he picked my brain, you know, for about 15, 20 minutes about, you know, the European game, how you adjusted to the lifestyle uh, in Greece. And, you know, I gave them, 
a lot of advice in terms of, you know, making challenges for yourself as an individual, making challenges for yourself as a, as a team, as a unit, and try your best to, you know, to uh, accomplish that goal, succeed or fail. What's your view on the new Panathinaikos team? Listen, you know, they have a lot of work to do. I know, um, you know, they're in a difficult time right now, but um, showing your love and support for a, a, a team or an organization you admire, um, you want to be there as well in, in, in a difficult moments too. I just don't want to stay on the sideline. Then once they return to glory, you know, it all was all good, but you want to be in a difficult time to support. I know it's a, a different time right now, but I know in my mind and heart, you know, one day, you know, uh, Panathinaikos will come back to its promise. So I'm not worried about that. How can Panathinaikos return to being the winning organizations they once were in the EuroLeague? I mean, uh, that's a real difficult question. You know, I'm not you know, really involved on, on the inside on how they, you know, make their decision, what they do financially. That's not really, you know, my business. Um, but, you know, the the level of players that we had here, it's, uh, you know, it's a different, you know, level of, of talent. Um, and, uh, you know, the EuroLeague is, is a little more difficult. I mean, it was always difficult, but it's a little more difficult now uh, because you're not predicted to be, you know, one of the top four teams or top eight teams, uh, you know, to make the playoffs. But that's, again, that's okay. It's it's part of basketball, and that's what people has to understand. You know, um, you're not going to have success every single year. And the dynasty that we had, um, you know, for my time that I was here or the 13 years that Jelko was here, um, that's very hard to, to repeat that. Um, so, again, you know, you, you – You stay in support and uh, you continue to hope and pray for the best that, you know, one day it, it'll uh, return. And, you know, when it happens, you know, I'll be there just like I'm, you know, supporting them now, uh, you know, through the difficult times. In all honesty, did you ever see a GM in Dimitris Diamandidis? No way. <laughs> uh, I didn't see that at all. Um But I remember, you know, reading an article uh, about him. He said he felt it was his duty, you know, to, you know, return to Pantanacos and help any way he can. And he, you know, also said that he also wished that, you know, other guys would return as well in some form or fashion. So by me showing up, uh, you know, of course, you know, I miss, you know, my former teammates and, you know, people I consider as brothers, you know, family to me. Um, but to, you know, to come here and also – you know, give advice to players who, who wants it to seek advice or, you know, any kind of thing that I went through. Um, I'm willing to, to, to give that back in the best way I can. Mm -hmm. uh, Mario Hezonia was an athlete that provoked waves of enthusiasm when he arrived in Greece. Uh, did the mm -hmm. two of you used to talk about uh, the Greens while in the States? Uh, Hezonia? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I remember my time in Charlotte, um, I think he was in Orlando one time in New York and, you know, we always, you know, cross paths and you don't have a lot of time to, to talk to, to players. Uh, it's a time and place for that. Um, but for the two minute conversation, pal, you know, uh, you're one of the best players, uh, Panathinaikos, I've seen you play. They I get to play there and it didn't happen at that time, but, you know, last year, um, you know, his situation is what it was. He had an opportunity to come here and play. Um, you know, I think he accomplished some some good things. Um, but now he's off to another chapter, you know, in his life. And we all have to, you know, move on from decision and um, choices. Another important summer development was uh, Zelko Bradovic returning to Partizan Belgrade after almost 30 mm -hmm. years. Uh, first of all, did you expect that? Uh, no, I didn't. But uh, I think it's a great look for him to return uh, home to uh, to organization and team. He helped, you know, be a, a European powerhouse. And I think that's the same thing he's going to do now. I know they're in the Euro Cup, but I'm pretty sure they'll be the favorite to win. Um, they have to work for everything. You know, nothing is given. And, you know, a coach is totally experienced with that. He understands that. And he will give that message to his players every single day. And I think they will take that message and, you know, apply it you know, to their work ethic, to their craft and, and you know, and win ball games behind that message.
Hmm. Since you know him inside out as a coach and as a person as well, uh, what do you think motivated him the most? You know, winning. I think winning, you know, he's still a competitor uh, deep down inside. And I think he still has a, a burning and undesired love to teach the game of basketball and, you know, let his players uh, soak up all the knowledge and experience uh, that he has, you know, from Panathinaikos to Benetton, Madrid, and Badalona, you, you know, the resume and also the history with his national team. Um, uh, his resume is, is unblemished. It's, it's flawless. And, you know, to, to be under, um, as a player, to be under that kind of umbrella with the coach of that statue, mm-hmm. um, you know, the sky's the limits for, for any players, uh, you know, that, that he coaches. Mm. Would you ever imagine him coaching in the NBA? He has said that the old discussions and negotiations that he had with NBA teams allowed when he was asked to do a job interview. Um, you know, I don't know. I think, again, you know, um, I think it has to be the, the right organization um, for him. Uh, the right organization has to trust him fully that he is totally capable of reaching success like he did over in Europe. And that organization has to support him even when he doesn't succeed. And, uh, you know, I think if, you know, he has that, I, maybe mm-hmm. he will have some small thoughts, but I think he loves, you know, where he's at right now. Um, and it's going to be very difficult for any team to try to, you know, persuade him to, to come over, you know, to the NBA. Mm. Do you agree with him that the NBA doesn't trust coaches from Europe, even those who are actually Americans, like David Blatt? I mean, Messina and Scariola re- returning to Europe after their assistant coaching term was over provides another example, maybe. I agree. You know, and I'm agree with a lot of things that coach says, but, um, you know, over here in Europe, uh, coaches have a lot of leeway to, you know, provocate and get stuff done. I think, uh, you know, for me with my old school roots, I, I think in some ways is how it should be done. You should be pushed to the best of your ability, regardless of how the message is, you know, as long as it's constructive criticism and as long as it stays within a game of basketball, you have to find a way to process uh, that message, regardless of how it was delivered. Because you also got to understand he's also in the heat of the battle too to win. And, um, you know, in the NBA, uh, the players have a lot of power and they persuade a lot of things that, that moves. And uh, I think that's be difficult to, you know, to, to fight for, um, you know, that supremacy or leadership to make things go my way or that way. Mm-hmm. But with Jelko, he wants it his way. And that's why uh, an NBA team, a NBA team has to cater to those, those skills because it is second to none. And if that happens, you know, one day, um, you know, I, I think he, he will succeed there as well, but I definitely believe he's comfortable, you know, where he's at. Um, you know, I know he's getting, you know, older a little bit and you don't know the challenges that he really wants for the next, you know, 10 years of his career. You know, we just have to wait and see and, you know, and whatever decision, you know, he, he makes, you know, you're always supportive, you know, of it. Mike, if you were to point to the single most positive and the by far most negative change that the EuroLeague has undergone since you were still playing, what would you say? I think the, the most positive is, is that everybody plays everybody now. You can't hide from anybody. Um, there was also times in, in my day where, you know, I think 2009, we didn't even play Jessica all year until the final. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you want to play against those teams during the season to have some kind of feel. I know there's a lot more games, you know, somebody might say it's, it's too many, but I, I think that's the goal that EuroLeague was really trying to get to uh, in the first place. You know, my time just, you know, ran out and, you know, I couldn't be a part of uh, the new stage of EuroLeague now, but I, I, I think, uh, you know, the EuroLeague game is, is, is at a beautiful moment right now. You know, hopefully one day, you know, the Final Four will probably come, you know, to America, the Madison Square Garden or the Barclays Centers to, um, to where people in the States can see, um, you know, the talent that is, you know, in Europe. You know, a lot of Americans don't see these European guys unless, the, you know, Olympics or mm-hmm. World Championships or until they drafted. But 
to kind of see how these guys go through the same process as NBA players. Uh, there's the stress, there's the struggle, there's, uh, you know, the winning, the losing, it's the good, the bad, everything that a lot of, you know, your, your league players, you know, go through the same thing as well. And, you know, hopefully they'll find a way to, to, to you know, to put that game of basketball on, on the platform um, in America. You know, all the games come on at like one, two, three o'clock during the day. It's a great time to watch a game during the day and then watch, you know, NBA game later at night. So if you're a basketball junkie, you know, you, you want, you know, more of that in your, your household. Mm. Um, of all the undersized centers that followed in your, in your footsteps, I think Kyle Hines has had by far the biggest success. Um, mm -hmm. You have witnessed firsthand his rise to prominence with Olympiacos when you were playing with mm -hmm. Panathinaikos. Uh, how do you mm -hmm. explain his longevity at a time when more traditional big centers are in fashion again? Well, I think, number one, he takes care of his body. You know, Kyle walks through the door right now. You see his physique. You know he's in shape. He's healthy. And I think he's uh, taken advantage of that. And, um, you know, when you treat your, your body well, your body, you know, will go a long way. You know, you take care of, you know, your knees, your ankles, stuff that you need to do. Uh, you know, your body will respond, you know, to a lot of things, even, you know, when, when, when you're hurt or have a small injury. Um, you know, your body responds, you know, very, very well. And we also saw that with Giannis, you know, this this time in the playoffs when he hyperextended his knee, but I felt that he trained himself and worked so hard on every muscle of his body mm -hmm. that when he had, the, you know, that injury, his body was able to recover in, in, in a matter of days. So, uh, you know, that's, that's one thing athletes have to, to take in, into account. That's also part of the commitment as well in this game, you know, taking care of your body. Um, you know, for myself, you know, I never was a, a bad eater, but, you know, when I got 26, I, I start seeing the benefits of, of food and how it helps you recover and, you know, how it can, you know, give you, you know, a lot of energy to, you know, to, to play the game at a high level. So, but also his worth ethic as well, you know, uh, like you said, he had early success of, you know, being Olympiacos, winning back-to-back -back titles. I think when you reach success like that at a very young age, you gravitate to that and you want more of it. Mm -hmm. So he just found the way to, to, to stay within the, the best version of himself on the court to help himself and his teammates. And that has gone a long way. He goes from Olympiacos to Cheska uh, last year. He was in the final four, um, you know, with Milano. And I think he's 33 or 34 now. I mean, you know, you know, he still has a few more years left, you know, in the tank and, You know, I hope and, you know, wish the best for him. I hope he's played longer than me, you know, than 36. Um, and you, you root um, for a guy like that. Um, you know, you know, my job when I played was, you know, to, to be the best version of myself. But if I can aspire, you know, uh, another teammate, if I can aspire uh, an opponent or anything, um, That, that does uh, a good justice, you know, for, for yourself in the game of basketball, because I hope I, I laid a platform down for, you know, other Americans to succeed over here. Um, you know, you know, the story is very unique of being 19 years here uh, with one team that is um, very rare for an American um, to do that. And for all the success uh, that I had um, with the club, that is also very rare. Um, for an American. And, you know, when you look at Kyle Hines, uh, you know, he is the, the staple of uh, the small ball center right now. And I was very happy to, to, to pass that torch. You know what I mean? And he's doing a great job of it. Did you have uh, mm -hmm. any talks with Spanulis on life after basketball? <laughs> of course. I mean, I'm actually sitting in his house right now. You know, I stayed the night. I spent the whole day, night with him. Uh, you know, we went to, to Nobu to have some sushi. Um, we had great conversations, uh, you know, the past, uh, certain memories. Uh, we talked about family values, talked about life, you know, character, uh, what his vision uh, is going to be, you know, after uh, basketball. I and mean, he has a lot of ideals. And, you know, I can't wait till you guys see what he, he has in store. I can't spoil any moments right now, you know, but. Um, he's definitely going to do something to stay around the game of basketball. Uh, but, you know, right now he's enjoying his time, you know, with his family and rightfully so. That's how it should be. And, uh, you know, by me coming here, you know, I, I had to, you know, get down here and, and you know, spend, spend some quality time with them. So he has made up his mind. 
on what he's going to do next? Well, he's made up his mind to turn and he wants to be around the game, but I don't think he's really put a staple on one thing on okay. this is what I want to do. So, uh, you know, when you retire, you have a lot of things running through your mind. You know, there's no manual uh, to this. You don't open up the book and turn to page one or chapter two and it tells you step by step of what to do when you retire. So um, it's, a, it's a figuring out stage that he's going through. And mm. I mean, you, you support it. You support it to, to the fullest. Mm. Uh, was it an easy decision for you to accept back then in 2014? Was it when you retired? Uh, say, yes, you know, I'm, I'm really. done. That's it. There's well, no you know, your mind, your mind is will always tell you, hey, you're able to play, you know, one more year. But, you know, my, my body had came to a point where it was time to bow out gracefully. Um, you know, the, the year I left Pantanitos to go to Fenerbahce, you know, my body went through a lot of stuff. I had a lot of injuries that I was going through there and I didn't have the season that I really expected. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, and even before, you know, I left, uh, you know, to, to Fenerbahce, I remember we was in the Komeski Cup uh, in Russia and I twisted my ankle very, very bad. Mm -hmm. uh, it was like a, a two month process to, to recover from that. And then when you go to Fenerbahce and you have that same injury later in the season, it's, you know, it was very tough for me to, you know, try to recover from that. And I uh, just, again, didn't have the success, you know, that I wanted. And then even, you know, coming back here in my last year, you know, with Pants and Ankles before I decided to retire, when you have to get up in the morning and do two hours of therapy just to practice, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a different struggle. And, you know, I kind of knew uh, probably three or four months into the season that this was probably going to, to be the end. Uh, but again, your mind always play tricks on you and always tell you, oh, you're the best. You can, you know, you can do it and push through it. But, mm. you know, I, ha I had to come to the grips with that. You know, even when I got home, uh, my daughter was born and, uh, you know, I just start thinking about different things in life. Um, you know, I got a call from, from David Griffin, who was the GM. Um, at Cleveland at that time. And he heard rumors that I was 50-50 on the fence of retiring or, or playing another year. And he just told me, listen, if you make the choice to stop, I would love to have you, you know, in Canton with our G League where you can, you know, uh, pass your knowledge down to, you know, the younger generation, mm -hmm. but also to get in the field to see if you like coaching. And uh, I made a commitment. I told myself if I don't like it, you know, I'll move on to something else. But um, I started to in enjoy, you know, what I was doing, um, you know, uh, looking at the video, you know, breaking it down, showing a presentation to the team. And then, you know, also walking, uh, you know, the team through, you know, four or five, six plays that your opponents will run, um, you know, scheming those uh, plays with your defensive coverages. And, uh, you know, how do we guard it? What's our communication? What's our rotation? Uh, you know, I'm taking all those guys through those details, which is the difference between winning or losing and, you know, uh, you know, stopping the team from scoring four, four or five, six points a game. So um, that's really, really big. It's something that I enjoy doing and I'm only going to keep continuing to get better at it. That's it. Mike, we're done. Thank you for your time, for your availability as well. I have to say a special thanks to, Vas to Vasilis Panoulis for hosting you. <laughs> <laughs> I will let him know. I'll let him know for sure. But it's uh it's it's really good to to you know to be back home again. Oh, I might go to vacation, but I got time for that. You know, Greece is not going anywhere, but you know, I had to get here, you know, to Athens and you know, again, see the people, you know, that are, you know, very important to me.